Welcome, I'm Julie Thompson, Executive Director of PAC-TV, and today we're hosting a COVID-19 Regional Forum on Mental Health Amid the Pandemic. This virtual panel forum was organized by Representative Kathy Lenatra, who will introduce you to the experts she has secured for today's special. To watch this forum live in Kingston, Plymouth, Pembroke and Duxbury, visit our government channels or watch online on our streaming channel by visiting pactv.org slash live. To ask questions during the forum, please email them to kingstoninfo or, excuse me, to questions at pactv.org. Again, for questions today, email questions at pactv.org. And to replay this forum or all of Kathleen's forums, please visit pactv.org slash regional. Welcome, Kathy. Hi, Julie. Thanks again for hosting um, this wonderful series that we've been able to do through PAC TV. So thank you to everyone that works at PAC TV for making this so easy and bringing this to the public. So the focus this week is on veterans and PSD and how this pandemic has exasperated feelings of isolation that are not healthy for those coping with PTSD in particular. We will also share some resources um, with veterans and family members that resources that they can access. So today we are fortunate to have Roxanne Whiteback. Did I say, is it Whitback or Whiteback? Whitback, Whitback. Whitback. Yes. And I, Andrea Tarek. Mm -hmm. um, so we're very fortunate to have these two. We're gonna start with Roxanne Whitback. Roxanne was named Veterans Officer in August, 2009 after oh two gosh. years as an administrative assistant in the Veterans Service Department at the Town Hall in Plymouth. She's a 13 year veteran of the United States Navy and she was named Veterans Service Agent of the Year in 2010. Roxanne also has, holds the distinction of being the first woman veterans agent in the position of Plymouth, but she also is the veterans agent in Plimpton. Is that correct, Roxanne? That is very correct, thank you. Thank you, thank you for joining us today. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me. So if you could just talk a little bit about what's going on now, and I mean, it, it's very timely. We have Memorial Day coming up on Monday. So I appreciate, exactly. I'm sure you're super busy. So I appreciate you taking the time today. Exactly, and unfortunately in Plymouth, um, well, all around Massachusetts, we've been kind of um, shut down to have our Memorial Day services that we would normally hold just because of the COVID. And, um, we are going to um, coordinate our Memorial Day service with our Veterans Day service in um, November, which is what we're looking forward to now. Um, but in the meantime, we have other things to do. Um, this weekend, I'll be laying uh, wreaths at all the, um, our war monuments in Plymouth. And also um, June, I think it's June 14th is Flag Day, but our we're going to do a... Um, placement of the flags for the veterans graves on that day since we couldn't have our we didn't get our flags in time which is very unfortunate but um we are going to make a very special um day of it on flag day or flag day weekend so that's what we're looking forward to and um it's it's trust me it's very hard to cancel some of these events because they're so meaningful to so many and especially memorial day because it's um you're, you're memorializing the ones that laid down their, their lives for our country and to, I don't want to say skip by it, but to have to not um, acknowledge it or be able to have a ceremony for it, it, it it's, it's, it's terrible. And I, I understand that, but we have to be in uh, line with the um, regulations. So we're going to do the best that we can. At this point, we're just going to do a um, me myself and um, the two commanders of the um, other veterans organizations in town, we're going to lay the wreaths and we're gonna make it very um, ceremonial, so, so to speak. speak. We're, we're gonna, gonna lay, lay the wreath, we're, we're gonna, gonna play taps, and it's gonna be, we're gonna make it as, as beautiful as we can, but unfortunately we can't have the public, we can't have the public there, which is very sad. Yeah, that is very sad. Have you been receiving a lot of calls from the veterans in your two towns, Plymouth and Plimpton, lately? Um, actually, I went to Plimpton today to deliver a food box because somebody needed some food, which I am very glad to do. Um, but no, I think everybody is doing pretty well, which is, you know, that's great. But they all have my number. They all know they can call me anytime and I'll be right there for them, um, which... Trust me, I, I don't take that lightly. I um, 
I, um, that's, that's my heart and soul right there. I take care of whatever I can for these guys while we're going through this. Yeah, sure. And I'm sure you have quite a few amount of veterans in those two towns. I do. I do. Plymouth obviously being, um, you know, much, much higher veteran count, but, um, we have been very lucky, my assistant Joanne, yours, and myself, we've been very lucky to, um, we kind of know what the other one does because we can only go in staggered. She'll go in one week, I'll go in the next, you know, that kind of thing. But we, we know where the other one left off and we can pick right up and we run with it. So we've got, we've got a very well-oiled machine. We've been doing this together now for like 12 years. So I feel very oh, wow. fortunate to have her. Yes, I've met her. She's wonderful. She's, She's wonderful. She's a great girl. Plimpton and Plymouth are very, very fortunate to have you in that position, Roxanne. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And Andrea, it's so nice for, to have you. I'm, I'm so grateful that you could join us today. Thank Andrea you for inviting me. Oh, my pleasure. Andrea Tarek grew up overseas at an international base in Belgium, which brings a unique perspective to military life issues. Andrea is a licensed mental health counselor and a graduate of Boston College. She is a daughter of a veteran, and her son is currently an officer in the Army after graduating from West Point in 2010. Andrea specializes in treating trauma, including sexual trauma and PTSD. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm so glad to have you. So what are you seeing where people are being isolated now? Well, I think one of... One of the most difficult things right now is if you think back to any time that we've had any natural disasters, the healing comes through joining together with your community. Um, if someone's house has been hit by a hurricane, for example, the community comes together and finds um, whatever the needs are, meets those needs together. And there's a lot of healing that takes place in a very traumatic situation when you can come together as a community and you can lean on people and you feel like people are there for you. And unfortunately in this disaster, we're being forced to isolate. And I think there is a great deal of trauma that comes just from that isolation. Um, and I know everyone is doing the best that they can, but along with that isolation comes a lot of uncertainty and that uncertainty just builds the anxiety, builds the depression. A lot of people are asking, you know, when is this going to end? How much longer do we have to do this? And unfortunately, those questions cannot be answered. No one has those answers. And so it's just this perpetual wheel of anxiety, depression, and isolation. And I have found the most helpful thing is to try to stay in the moment. Um, if anyone does yoga or meditation, those are exercises, both physical and mental, that keep you in the here and now, that keep you in the present moment. And that's easier said than done. Um, in our society, we're constantly taught to move forward, you know, move forward, um, do more, be more, use more. And so we're not skilled at being mindful. We're not skilled at staying in the present moment. And when we can exercise that, whether it's through reading a meditation, um, YouTube has some wonderful meditations on it, anything that we can do to try to stay in the moment and not think forward, because that just perpetuates the uncertainty. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Julie, did you say that you, I'm seeing that you might have a question? Oh, there's always a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> um, one, one of the ones that, that is, is kind of a theme that is, is coming through is veterans have a kind of a brotherhood, um, just like police officers have a brotherhood, that, that kind of thing. So aside from all the things in their own lives, their own families, their children, their spouses, their, their jobs, whatever they have now, they also, I would assume, are also concerned with that brotherhood. Roxanne, could you speak to how that is heightened right now? Um, actually, you know what, I, 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 we definitely have a brotherhood or a sisterhood, and um, you always want to watch the back of, of a brother who or a sister who's not doing as well. So we always have that. I'm going to say radar out for um, veterans that are less fortunate, that are struggling, because uh, 
my my um my experience with veterans is they will be the last person to say can you help me um and that's part of the problem is when they come to the table um or come to my table i should say they're they've they've already gone through everything so they're they're definitely down and out and um it's unfortunate but you know what we're right there for them and and i uh, trust me i I truly believe our veteran service officers in our area, um, Plymouth, Plimpton, Kingston, um, Carver, we have great people in those seats to take care of, you know, to, to, to know where we need to go with veterans. So I hope the public knows that we've got good, good people in charge that are not going to let the ball drop. Right. Another question on that is, Kathleen, over the past four weeks when you've been having these uh, mental health uh, amid the, the pandemic forums, we've touched a lot on how suddenly people, it's being brought out into the public that it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to be struggling. It's okay to talk about it. I think we've, we've, we've messaged that more than ever over the past four weeks. Do either of your guests feel that this has actually, to what you just said, Roxanne, has this maybe helped the veterans to see that they're not alone in asking for help and then suddenly everyone needs to be asking for help at this time? Is that comforting at all to them? You know what? If I was on that side of the fence, I would be able to answer it better. But um, I just know that every phone call that comes into our office, we treat it with, you know, dignity, dignity and respect that they deserve. And um, everyone handles things differently. There's a lot of different struggles on lots of different levels. So, you know, one call might be for food or one call might be for to do a claim and, or somebody else is what's going on with my claim. You know, why is it being stalled? And it's not being stalled. Unfortunately, we're just in a, you know, we're in a holding pattern in so many ways in our lives. So, um, I think that they're being, I actually, the veterans, uh, I gotta tell you at, the veterans that I've come in contact with are very understanding and they just kind of like waiting, you know, riding the storm out, so to speak. Good for them. And did you have any comments on that, Andrea? Andrea, um, excuse me. No. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted okay. to go back to Roxanne for one second. When you mentioned that um, it's hard for a veteran to reach out for help. And as you know, I have a son that's overseas in the army. Yes. And when I spoke to him a few weeks ago, I just being a mother felt that he, there was something wrong. And, um, and wouldn't you know, I get a text from today and whose letter did he get today? But Miss Roxanne Whitbecks and he wanted uh -huh. me to thank you. So I wrote letters and I had some friends write letters and he got them today and he's six hours ahead of us and he sent me a text and he was so grateful he wanted me to make sure that i told him i was going to actually see you today um he wanted me to make sure that you were thanked but it made him happy but he never would have admitted or asked of course yeah. and you being the mother you can kind of see that and we always watch out for our kids but you know what when our kids become soldiers it's a different it's a different kind of momhood at that point it's not you know what I mean? They're soldiers now and it's like, and we're still moms, but they're going to let us know where they want us to step in. And, um, they're proud men and women that we've raised and I couldn't be more proud. I've got a son that's serving in the Navy and, um, I couldn't be more proud. And Andrea has, a um, it's two sons serving. Um, so you know what? I, we get it. And Kathy, you have a son serving as well. So we understand but it's hard because it's not in our control anymore as a mother. I think too, going, going back to the, um, the idea that, you know, PTSD has been so stigmatized, mm -hmm. so stigmatized and that's been a barrier. And now I think um, because everyone is experiencing this giant trauma of this pandemic, um, I think that has oddly destigmatized it somewhat. I I hope so, Andrea. Seriously, because PTSD, a lot of people, and 
I have to say this as taking a claim, as a claim, you know, taking claims every day. I have people that say, well, you know what, I have an FID card or I have this or I have that. And I don't want to claim PTSD because I'm afraid I'm going to lose that. And it's like, you're not going to lose it. You just have to, you don't ever have to disclose to somebody what your disability is. You have, if you want to say you're a service connected disabled veteran, that's fine, but you never have to disclose what your disability is for. And I've had way too many people go into that exam thinking they're going to lose an FID card or they're not going to be able to have their job as a this one or that one. And you can't go in there like that. You can't. You have to spill your guts out and you have to say what's bothering you. Just like you, they came to me and told me what was bothering them and I passed that on. You can't hold back in the, um, in the comp and pen exam because if you do, you're just going to, you're, you're going to ruin your claim, and but they're afraid. And that's where, Andrea, maybe you can speak to that. How do they get past that, you know, being able to disclose and not being afraid of, you know, losing a job or losing an FID or whatever? Well, when it comes to PTSD and trauma, um, so one of the first things that as a mental health clinician that we do is we create safety. We don't address the trauma right away, which is very different from your job, Roxanne, because I imagine you get right down to business. I get the trauma. I get the trauma. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's not always easy yeah. trying to drag it out of them. You know that. No. It, and so establishing a relationship of trust with them, trust with their environment, um, is very, very important. And unfortunately, it's not something easily done and it takes a while. And so that's quite a challenge. And so for anyone to go into a meeting where they feel like they have, you know, their life on the line again, um, their livelihood on the line, their opportunities on the line, and they're talking to a complete stranger is just, um, has the potential of, of, creating more anxiety than they can bear. Right. But safety is really paramount. It's the foundation of doing any kind of trauma work with anybody. And going back to our situation right now, uh, that's compromised. So it's very difficult. And it's so hard because they don't have access to us like they always did. You could walk into the office and be able to talk to somebody. Now you don't have that luxury. It's by phone and hopefully somebody's returning that call. Yeah. Yeah. Challenging. Kathy, I got a, I have a, a, a viewer who wrote in a question for, it's for Andrea. Um, for family members living with someone who may not formally have been diagnosed with PTSD, can you describe some of the different types of therapies that are most effective? Effective for the family, effective for I think for both the person with yeah, PTSD for both. or the spouse because they're all separate entities and they're treated differently. Well, why don't um, you why don't you do each one? Okay, so there is a curriculum out that is specifically for trauma. It's a twelve week curriculum. It's called CPT. Um, it's very effective, but it's also very challenging. Um, and so it's really only effective with a certain, um, how do I put this? It's not for everybody, um, but it is, CPT is a very good trauma therapy protocol. Um, and it is short term, it's 12 weeks, but it's very intensive, very intensive. Um, and that is, that is something that I've also, um, I, I'm also a CPT provider. That is done both individually and in groups, but it is most effective individually, um, in, my, in my experience anyway. I don't know about overall. Um, there is also CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, and that is very practical. And that's, you know, certain people who like hands-on practical protocols, that is something that's very, you know, you fill out worksheets, um, you address your thoughts, you address your emotions, you address the things, the, the reactions that you have. So that's very effective. Um, 
As far as therapy for the spouse, so there is there is a possibility of a spouse who's living with someone with PTSD that they get secondary PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, and so that also needs to be recognized and treated in tandem with giving the spouse some tools of how to respond, react to the PTSD of their spouse. Um, a lot of people just don't know how, you know, they, they feel like they don't have tools to understand what PTSD is, what's normal, what's not normal, when to be afraid, when not to be afraid, and what resources do I have? How can I help my spouse? Uh, my spouse is suffering, and I don't understand PTSD, and I don't have any tools to help my spouse through this to support my spouse. Um, and so therapy for the spouse is of someone with PTSD is very, very important, paramount. Do you see a lot Does of that, that answer your question? Roxanne? Yeah, yeah, I think that's great. Um, Roxanne, do you have those those types of what what, what Andrew, Andrea yes. was just describing? Do you have those available through through your? Um, well, Andrea agency? and I work very closely together, which is a great thing. But um, she just brought that to mind that I, you know, what something I've never even thought about is the the. Uh, the spouse of a veteran who's suffering from PTSD is secondary uh, PTSD. And it, it, it's so true, but I just, you know what, you never know it until somebody says it. It's like, okay, yep, for sure. So yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's really important is not only the care of the veteran, but the care of the, the spouse as well. And the family that might be living. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And if, if there's, signs that people can look for um is it easier if you're given kind of like a, a roadmap of these are the things you really need to look for if you know you have a veteran that is served in your in your home is that helpful well i can tell you some of the um the symptoms that veterans have explained to me um as you know what their their ptsd is is um self-isolation um stare you know staring away from big groups loud noises uh having your uh back to the wall where you can see how you can get out just like hyper vigilance mm -hmm. um so i think that um that's real to them and and god bless them you know they've been in situations that we haven't so um anything that they share with me i'm i'm like i'll take it in and do the best i can with it and help them with their claim and um Nine times out of 10, we're very successful. Um, I go to training three times a year, and um, I feel that my my skills as far as taking a claim are, you know, they're 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 very they're good. And um, and and you're out there for the veteran. That's their livelihood. That's their life. So you're putting your reputation behind what they're claiming. And you know what? I feel very good about that every time I do it. I have a question. So Andrea, the, the, um, what Roxanne mentioned, some of the signs I, you know, I have a, a husband that's in law enforcement and we're friendly with a lot of people in law enforcement in first responders. So mm -hmm. for someone that is a first responder or in law enforcement or a CO, would those be some of the signs as well? Yes. Uh, hypervigilance is definitely a sign. Um, another sign of PTSD is numbing. They don't feel anything. They're not, um, they have an awareness that they should be feeling more about their family members or about a situation than they do. And so that's another, you know, they'll, um, they'll mention that awareness that I should be feeling more. I should be feeling sadder. I should be feeling more compassionate. I should be, you know, engaging more with my children and they, they don't. And there's reasons for that too. Um, people with trauma often have nightmares and night terrors and night terrors are something that are observed by a family member, not by the person having them. Um, they'll wake up and think they had a normal night's sleep. They might be a little tired and foggy, but their spouse will tell them you were thrashing, you were punching, you were yelling, you were crying, and I couldn't wake you up and they'll have no memory of it. So night terrors are just as damaging 
as nightmares and they're harder to treat. Mm -hmm. Um, I have done a lot of dream work with clients with PTSD and that is just something really interesting to behold. Um, oftentimes people with PTSD will have mo the same dream either in various versions or they'll have it over and over and over again. And when we do the dream work on it to find out what does, what is your subconscious trying to tell you needs to be addressed, then they stop having the dream. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's a whole nother area, but with night terrors, we can't work on, on what is happening subconsciously. And so we have to do other, other work around it. Um, the hypervigilance that Roxanne is talking about is across the board. Anyone who has been in any kind of role where they're in charge of other people and they're worrying about other people and they feel responsible for other people's safety will definitely experience the hypervigilance even when they're not at work. Um, the numbing that happens is sometimes due to a, a subconscious fear of losing loved ones. So if I don't draw close to my loved one, then if I lose them, it won't hurt as much. It won't be so devastating. It won't be so life-threatening. And this is subconscious. It's not conscious. Um, and so again, going back to a spouse who is dealing with someone with PTSD, they feel rejected. They feel isolated from their spouse not understanding that the spouse also uh, doesn't understand why they're numbing and isolating from their family members. Um, and so sort of working together with them to understand that a lot of this stuff is subconscious. It's coming from the primitive part of the brain that is all about survival, not happiness. It's about survival. And that's the part where the amygdala is, where our emotions come from, particularly anger, because it's all wrapped up in fight or flight or, or freeze. Um, and so our, the way that our brain operates is very normal to a trauma. We are supposed to have certain things happening in our body, a numbing that takes place or adrenaline rush that makes us stronger so we can fight or we can run. And those are normal reactions to a dangerous situation. But with PTSD, they're overemphasized and they're no longer being controlled by the prefrontal cortex, which is our reasoning part of our brain. And so those two different parts of our brain come in conflict and it scares the veteran. It scares them. And so um, it scares anyone with PTSD. And so they are having normal reactions to an abnormal situation. And when they can understand that, because they feel like they're going crazy. Someone who has PTSD feels like, I don't have control over what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, what's happening here, my body sensations. And so when they can understand this is a normal reaction to an abnormal situation, they can start to get help for it, if that helps. It does. That's a concern as we go through this pandemic a lot of our first responders and such, or people that have already suffered from PTSD with all the isolation that a couple months down the road, people will have these feelings and not know what, what it is. And right. as you said, their spouse or their partner or their family may not either. So it, it sounds like there's, we need to have an understanding is what I'm saying yes. of what these feelings yeah. are, because if we can recognize them as they come up. And, I, I, and that they're, I'm sorry. It's fascinating what, what you just said was just absolutely fascinating. The two things, the hypervigilance and the dreaming. And we've mm -hmm. had a number of people, um, experts, Kathy, that you've had on these forums that talk about how people that have not been veterans or have not been uh, first responders are, are, are having really, really brilliantly um, graphic dreams that are really, they remember them and they're, they've never had them before. So right. not only are the veterans dealing with that and, and all the other things that are piled on top of that, but people that have not been um, through PTSD are also having that. And, and to speak to your hypervigilance, I would think you said um, that a lot of veterans are used to being in control of, of, of keeping their people safe. And that's because they, they could control the environment and they're always watching the environment. And, and now I would assume they feel like they have no control over the environment either. So that must be a double whammy. 
Exactly. Anyone who's been trained in their job that that um, is a dangerous job where they're in charge of other people or they are being relied upon by other yeah. people, you know, it might be the guy or the girl right next to me. Um, anyone who experiences that feels this sense of, of responsibility, right? And then they've been trained how to handle dangerous situations, whether they're in the medical field or whether they're um, in law enforcement or corrections officers, they have a support system in place. They have people to their right and to their left who are trained like they are to handle whatever their particular job is to do. And in this situation, we don't have answers. We don't have tools, right? Um, and so that feeling of I'm not prepared, that feeling of what's going to happen next, um, I think it's emphasized for people who are used to having the answers, used to having the training, used to being prepared for anything that's going to happen in their field. Are you seeing a lot of that, Roxanne? Uh, no, I agree with what she's saying 100%. And um, like I said, this is this is spreading way past veterans now. It's, um, it's, this isn't just a veterans thing anymore, PTSD. Not that it ever has been, but I think that's where the, the highlight remains is, um, you know, veterans with PTSD. But you know what, people that are facing new challenges, seniors that are isolated for months on end and, and don't have anyone to talk to or, or whatever, I, that's, those are things that are going to bring PTSD. I, I think they're going to bring PTSD around, but if the veteran doesn't want to recognize it or doesn't know what it is, I, I, I'm not sure how we can help them, but uh, it's this isolation is, is, is terrible for a lot of people, especially for our seniors. Mm. What can we do as just as, as neighbors, friends, what can everyone do to help anyone that might be suffering from this. I mean, even as little as, I know a lot, I've heard a lot of people say, just be extra special nice because you don't know what people are going through. Can you give advice to everyone? Um, because you have, you have a, a population there that we have to be hyper vigilant about and hyper careful and, and try to help. But if we all get in the habit of having good habits of being kind, is that helpful? Can you give any any um, information or any any hints to us of how we all, as people, can be reacting to other people during this very uncertain time? We can start with Roxanne and then definitely go to Andrea. It just makes me sad that we have to be reminded to be nice to other people. I'm sorry. I, I that's not my mantra, and you know, I it bothers me that you know what. Everyone has their own story. Everyone has their own situation. Just be kind. You don't know what they've lived through. You don't know what they've done. Just be kind. And I think that we're losing that, unfortunately, due, due to the people that are, like, you know, shut in or whatever. But I think we're losing that. And you know what? At the bottom, at the end of the day, we're all people and we, we all have feelings. And let's just treat each other, like, decently. That's really, I mean, that's, to me, the crux of it. You know what? We can get through this, but just be kind. Be kind. And it's so much easier to be kind than to be hateful to somebody. I'm, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know what? Let's just bring kindness to the table. Mm -hmm. And Andrea? Yeah, I think um, absolutely, Roxanne. And she is such an example of kindness. I mean, just today she was out delivering a food box. Um, there are some things I heard on the news. This is probably one of the few positive things I heard on the news. So I stopped listening to it altogether. Um, a, a gentleman, I think this was in New York, went out and bought some roses and put a rose on the doorstep of each of his neighbors. So there was no contact. There was no personal contact, but it was a message of, you know, you're cared about, you're thought of. A simple gesture, but meant the world to his community. I know Which someone door? else who Which painted door? rocks with hopeful sayings on them, saying, keep hope alive, or, you know, um, 
um, stay positive, any kind of positive remark was left on this rock and they put it out in a park for people to find all over the place. And uh-huh. gestures like that, you know, take me home and remember your loves kind of thing. Any gesture like that makes the person doing the gesture feel so much better about themselves, about their contribution, because isolation is not just about other people can't come to me. It's also about, I can't reach out to other people. I'm not being heard. I'm not being seen. I'm not being felt. And so anytime we can do a little gesture where we're putting it out there and we're connecting with complete strangers even in a safe way, it makes two people feel better not just one, you know, whoever and has don't something. You think, there's and, there's something. and don't you think that goes so far, Andrea? Yeah. It really does. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's almost a so habit. Little you, things. It's almost like a habit it's you have to. Things. A phone call. Um, yeah. You have to get into this, doing this again. It's, we, we, for the last 10, 12 weeks, we've all been kind of insulated or, or how do I handle my specific area? How do I handle my life, my family? And it, it, is it a habit that you just begin to, you try to smile at people, you try to give them a nod, you try to, like, like that's beautiful to put a rose on your neighbor's, you know, doorstep. That's just wonderful. It's habits that we can get into and we can mm-hmm. do every day. It doesn't cost you anything it, it, except kindness. Yes? Exactly. 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 There was mm-hmm. one comment about the soldier's home that had so many deaths. What does, what does that do? I, I, it, what does that do for veterans when they hear that soldiers, so many of them, died in a, in a particular soldier's home of COVID nineteen? Well, you know what? I'm going to leave that to um, the experts to figure that out. Um, I, it, it breaks my heart that um, the numbers are so high. I don't know why they're so high, but you know what? Um, I'm sure this is going to get the attention it needs to, but where was the attention, you know, leading up to this and why did this happen? I don't know. I I wish I knew because I I think that those answers, they're going to be demanded from the families and they should be. And to speak to that also, um, connecting it to what we just talked about, acts of kindness, a photographer went to the homes of each of the loved ones that passed and did, I believe it was a slideshow. It may have been more, but took pictures of their loved ones and made it like this presentation or a memorial for them that I've heard is really beautiful. It is really nice. I've seen it. It's amazing. So that's that act of kindness that can counteract this horror that, that we're living in. That's what a wonderful story. That's, that's great. And there are those stories, if you look for them, they're everywhere. Kathy, you must hear they're about, everywhere. you must hear an awful lot about the kindness stories that go on. Kathy, don't you, as, as a, as a state oh, rep. Sorry, I didn't hear my name. Yeah. I do. And it's funny, you know, just driving through and we see everybody has a heart on their door or they have those wood pallets with the big hearts on them. If you walk through my neighborhood, there is a, we have a neighborhood website, um, Facebook page, and someone put a map on there to find those kindness rocks throughout the neighborhood. The children are drawing in their driveways, you know, stay safe. We're all through this together. We love you. So I see lots of those things just in my own neighborhood, in my own district alone. But there's so many wonderful stories. Um, I just want to go back a little bit because I was, as I was listening um, about making people feel safe. And I think that's our, as a parent, I think that's our duty too, because I know our children are going through something right now. And to make them feel safe, even though we really don't have all the answers, but I thought that was a very important point is that when you start your counseling that you make the person feel safe. So as a parent, that really hit me is when they have questions, as long as they feel safe at home and with their parents, I think that would make a big difference too with our children. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what about what about all the, the graduates now that are that have signed up to go into the service? And I think they leave in June or July. Um, is there a special, is there something different this year that 
obviously, that, that we've ever had before and how do, how do parents, how do teachers, administrators, how does the community help those people and those families because not only are you are sending off your children into a whole new world, but you can't control anything about their world. Kathy, you must feel that. <laughs> uh, you just brought me right back to when Nick went in and I, I almost I teared up there for a minute and that was during regular times and I felt that I couldn't control um, the situation there and to me it was seriously one of the hardest things of my life to let him go and do that as proud as um, his father and I were of him it was really hard so the way that it is now, I, I'm sure it's much more difficult. And my heart goes out to the parents um, and the the siblings of everyone entering the military now. And, you know, good for them taking that step. They must be so proud. Can I just say one thing on the, on, on the heels of that is um, a lot of people assume that they can... Um, you know, oh, you have someone in the service, uh, call veteran services, they'll give you an address to send a card to. And that doesn't work. Um, Kathy had um, emailed me her son's address and I was able to send a card. And I'd send a card to everyone that's serving. That's not a problem for me. But um, we don't have this magic list of all the people that are serving. We have no idea. It's all protected information. So if anyone has a um, son or daughter that's serving and they want us to recognize, please just send me, a, send me a note. I will make sure we get a card out to them as soon as possible. But for people that think that that's an automatic thing, or we know that information, we don't, that's all, it's all protected information. So like I said, I, I would be more than happy to send out a card, several cards a day, as long as I have addresses. That's sweet. Uh, I know that in, in my hometown of Pembroke, there's a, a military support group that always collects and sends packages to, to the, the troops that are overseas. Has, has that activity had to be curtailed in any way because of this? Mm. Well, I know in Plymouth it has. Um, we don't have, number one, those packages to get off are very expensive. Yeah. And uh, the VFW used to do it like consistently and then you run out of money um you you get the supplies in that people want to donate but it's the cost of the postage that people just they don't support that and unfortunately the u.s ps they can't either so it's kind of like the the servicemen's at a loss because there's lots of people that want to send things but they can't because of the postage or whatever we we always collect at um christmas uh thanksgiving you know we always collect um whatever people want to give and give it out to veterans but as far as our guys that are serving overseas it's it to me it's very sad because we don't have a way to reach them unless we have a specific like you know kathy gave me nick's address so i was able to send something to nick but unless we have a specific address we don't we don't know how to who to send them to if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I also have another question for you, Roxanne. Um, how veterans can find their veteran service officer contact information if they, they aren't from one of your towns? And are there websites that either um, can help them, uh, suggesting also with PTSD sim symptoms, awareness, treatment, et cetera? Is there universal right. websites? and? Um uh, the t in, the t in the Commonwealth, the, um, there's a veteran service officer for every town. So you can just either Google it or you can call DVS and they can give you the number. But if you Google uh, VSO in the town of Plymouth, my name's gonna pop up, um, which is great. But um, if, if they have any problems or questions, they can call DVS, which is Department of Veteran Services, who we report to, and they will make sure that the person's connected with a VSO. And what about websites? Which that, is important because you've got to know what your VSO is. Oh, absolutely. And I would assume Sorry. that that, 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 um, that veteran service um, officer could help them with websites or suggestions for uh, places absolutely. to go for, the, for every we get, other. We get questions all the time. I have yeah. to laugh because the other day um, somebody called into veteran services and said, well, we want to get chickens. And we're, we're veterans <laughs> in Plymouth. And it's like, 
Okay, well, that's not our wheelhouse. You have to talk to the Board of Health about that. But anything with the, the associated with veterans that comes into our office, and we're lucky enough to be able to send them where they need to go. But we, we will always help people that have questions. So if it's a veteran, if it, the word veteran's in it, give us a call. We will help you. Absolutely. That's wonderful. I know there's a lot of um, kids that are, that are getting together and uh, like making cards for the first responders and they're making hearts and they're making little things that they want to give to the nurses and doctors and the police officers and the fire and EMS. Is there some, is there any way that people could do this for our veterans? You know what, we've gone down this road before and I always had a really good address at Walter Reed to send it to the uh, wounded warriors, but they won't accept it anymore. So. Yeah. Uh, right now that's kind of on a hold unless they want to like we have local schools here that will um, make cards for veterans and we always put them out on the counter at Memorial Day, Veterans Day or Christmas, Thanksgiving. Whenever we get the cards from the kids, we put them on the counter and, and when veterans come to our office, we just give them to them. That's nice. We, that's try, nice. we try to keep everything local. Yeah. Yeah. Because we yeah. have a lot in need right here uh we don't need to donate to wounded warriors over in dc or whatever just keep it local because yeah. we've got a lot of veterans in need right here in plymouth that's right yeah that's all the questions i had for right now kathleen oh thank you um just to go back to the the soldiers home you know that investigation is so important and um like you said, Roxanne, it, we need to know what happened there so that is never repeated. It is vitally important that we found out, find out where where what happened, where the miscommunication was, because it, it, it was horrific. In my words, in my mind, it was it was horrific what happened there. Really was perfect word um, for that, I, Kathy. I, I, I do too. I do too, as, as well as my colleagues. Um, but I do want to discuss, even though it is a different kind of Memorial Day that we're having here, some towns are still doing some things. Um, Plimpton did a wonderful thing there. That's one of your towns that you do. They're on duty, yeah. off duty members of the Plimpton Fire Department, um, along with the uh, Selectman's assistant, Bridget Martin. Yeah, Bri, I love her. Graves and uh, members of the military who were buried in Plimpton. That was beautiful. I think that was highlighted on the news as well last night. Um, and Kingston, I didn't see that. You didn't, it was on 25. I I oh. um, in Kingston, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to have the parade in Kingston this year, but the veterans will still be laying the wreaths at each memorial. Um, and then there, we're planning on just a little ceremony back at the townhouse, and that will be hosted by, a oh, videotaped by PAC TV. We'll televise that, which is wonderful. And I drove by Halifax Town Hall the other day, and they just have an amazing display of flags, too, something to drive by. So even though we can't do what we're normally doing, there are some memorials, and I hope that everybody takes a moment on Monday and just through this weekend, really, to reflect and remember the people that served for us and, and died for us, you know, for our freedom. If, if there and I know Plymouth, and, um, you mentioned Plymouth. No, go ahead, Roxanne. Next year. Oh, oh just, to, just to add on the, uh, the, I was just gonna say, to add on the coattails of that um, Monday, where, like I said, we're gonna do a very small group, um, just like um, the leaders in the veterans group, like, um, the VFW, the American Legion, myself, we're going to um, go to each memorial and we're going to lay a wreath and we're going to say a prayer and we're going to play taps at each one. We can't advertise that because we can't have crowds, but that's what we're going to do. And it's important to um, the veterans in, t in town that they said, Roxanne, we need to do something. And I'm like, I'm with you. As long as it's not a bigger group than 10, we'll just make the small group and we'll just go around and we'll do what we can. And um, I hope people appreciate that for what it is. I, I get that they want to have a parade. I get that they want to um, lay the, the, or do the flags and trust me, I want to do it too, but we haven't been able to. So we're going to wait till a time that we can, and we're going to honor the way we can with the restrictions that are facing us. And I just hope that um, people understand that. it's it, We're not cutting anybody out. We're not discluding anybody. It's just, we need to be safe. We need to make sure that we do it within the regulations that are handed to us. 
but we want to make sure that the veterans know that, you know, we understand Memorial Day. It's, it's a given, you know, we understand what the meaning is and we're not, um, passing it by, by any stretch of the imagination, but we just can't do it the way we want to right now. So we're going to kind of go by and we're going to recircle back hopefully in November for us in Plymouth in November, we're going to make it a joint, a joint, uh, ceremony, which is hard because they're so, they're just so different. Veterans day is so different than Memorial day, but yeah. we're going to do what we can do. That's Thank wonderful. you. Thank you. I just want to thank all of you. Andrea, do you have some last words for us? I just, thank you so much for having me on here. And thank you, Roxanne. Your Roxanne is like the shining star of VSOs. So. <laughs> She's the high bar. <laughs> I'm the old no, bar. I've been doing it a long time. <laughs> I hope that all of this really brings us to a more compassionate place. Um, and like Roxanne said earlier that, you know, we start focusing on kind acts and kindness and what that means. And this is certainly a wonderful opportunity to really figure out how to do that. It is. Ladies, thank you so much. This has been wonderful as, as usual, Kathy, you, you, you bring together really great peoples and really great subjects. Uh, Memorial Day is on, on Monday and there's things you can do. You can go to a cemetery and if you see a, a veteran's grave, you can, you can, you can put a flower down there if, if no one else has visited. There's, there's things you can do. You can post something on, on social media, even if you don't know a veteran or don't have one in your family. Roxanne, you're right. It, 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 we should be kind <laughs> every day, but being reminded of being kind, um, it's, it's okay to be reminded. Step out of yourself for two seconds. Exactly. Yeah, step out of yourself and just remember that everybody is going through something right now. I wanted to point exactly. out, yeah. I wanted to point out on Kathy's, um, if you go to kathylanatra.com, uh, if you click under the COVID-19 uh, tab at, at the top, and then you cl clicked on mental health services, all the different, um, all, all the information, I should say, that you've had over the, over the past four or five weeks is all on this particular page. So all the resources that you might need are on under this mental health services tab. And you, and I'm sure Kathy, you will add today's information to that as well. Mm -hmm. Of we course. Will, yeah. Okay. And it's been just, just really wonderful. Um, if you notice today, we have the date stamped on here and what day we, we um, filmed this particular um, forum through um, Kathy Lenatra. And if you want to see this again, go to pactv.org slash regional. We thank you so much for putting this together. Roxanne, thank you. Andrea, thank you so much for being here. This is great information today. Good reminders to all of us. This is Juliet PAC-TV saying have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Stay safe and uh, we'll see you next time.